in biology, which is what we're studying this year, you have a variety of different types of tools that we use. Uh, and we're going to talk about some of those. We're going to use some of them in this unit. Some we won't use now, but we will use later on as the year goes along. And I'll tell you about some of those, some of those tools. Each discipline has their own tools that are important. Some of them overlap between the various sciences, but we'll talk about some of them. Uh, one important one, obviously, is the microscope. So microscope is important, um, obviously, because it allows us to see things that are too small to see with the naked eye. And we talked about this back in seventh grade, the discovery of cells and microbes and uh, various other things did not come about until microscopes were really started to be developed, started to be perfected. Um, and that happened in around the 1600s. That's when um, lenses first started to be developed that could magnify up to a great degree, um, increase the resolution of how, how much you could see under these, um, under these microscopes. So uh, what was the factor in developing these types of microscopes were lenses. So working with glass, um, there were, before the 1600s, there were magnifying glasses. They were ground by hand into certain shapes that would magnify an image. Um, but the refinement of how those lenses were ground, the purity of the glass, the techniques to make them into lenses led to the development of telescopes and microscopes around the same time. They all involved glass lenses that allowed us to see things either far away or things that are very small. They started just pretty simple, single lenses. And from there, microscopes became more uh, complex, multiple lenses started to be used, and so forth. This is one of the first microscopes. So um, Anton van Leeuwenhoek was a Dutch, uh, he was actually, his job originally was a draper. He would make drapes like curtains. And um, he wasn't really a, a scientist as a job. He was uh, in this field and he wanted to invent a lens that would allow him to inspect the threads in the drapes that he was making to ensure their quality. And so he developed um, really powerful microscopes that used just a single lens. And he's sometimes called the father of microbiology, even though he never published a research paper or a book about microscopy. Um, he made observations, he wrote letters. Uh, he was very secretive though. He would never show anybody his best microscopes. If somebody visited him to see sort of the microscopes he was working with, he would show them like his, his inferior ones. He didn't want anyone to discover how he was making his microscopes. He thought if other people learned how he did it, he would be forgotten in history. Um, and mo at this time, most lenses were made by grinding glass into a shape. He actually would heat up glass and then stretch it out and get a tiny thread of liquefied glass and then put it in water. And you would get these tiny, tiny spheres that were lenses. And the smaller the sphere, the more powerful the lens was. And this is what the microscopes he used looked like. It doesn't look anything like a microscope we are familiar with today, not like these microscopes. Uh, what the, the lens he created, that little tiny sphere, is mounted right here. You would hold this like very close to your eye. You'd have to look towards the light source. And on this little pin, that's where you would put whatever you want to see. These these um, knobs and screws could move the little pin left and right, up and down, so you could see different parts of that sample. And there's another screw that would move it closer and farther away from the lens to focus. So this is sort of one of his microscopes. Um, he, these microscopes could magnify up to 275 times. And, so, and um, historians believe some of his best microscopes that we don't have today could, might, could magnify up to 500 times, just with this one tiny lens. So it's pretty amazing what he did. Um, but only uh, nine of those microscopes um, have been preserved through history. He looked at bacteria. He was one of the first to find bacteria. Um, 
cells, vacuoles, muscle fibers. You saw lots of different things that people never knew existed because they didn't have powerful enough microscopes to see them. Um, then Robert Hooke was the other famous uh, person in the 17th century that really uh, became famous for his work with microscopes and other things. He's called a polymath. He made discoveries in all sorts of different areas. Uh, very, very uh, well-known scientist in chemistry and physics and, and so forth. He published um, a book called Micrographia in 1665, and it basically was his collection of drawings that he saw under the microscopes and also telescopes. He's the one that came up with the word cell because he thought those little boxes he saw looked like the cells that monks uh, stayed in in a monastery. Uh, this was the work that he published. Okay? Um, and here's some examples of drawings he made. This was cork. He would make very detailed drawings of it. There's another one. And the microscope, this is the microscope he used to make these drawings. Probably it looks a little bit more like you would expect a microscope with multiple lenses and in the form you know we might be familiar with. Yeah, he was English. Robert Hooke was English, and Leeuwenhoek was Dutch. So today we have microscopes, a, very, a large variety of types of microscopes. The ones we will use are the compound microscope, which you used a lot before. Uh, they have two lenses, uh, each of which magnifies the image, the eyepiece, and then the objective. calculate the total power of the eyepiece by multiplying the power of the eyepiece times the objective lens. Compound light microscopes, the very best, uh, can magnify up to 1,500 times. Ours go to 400 times. They have special lenses called oil immersion lenses, where it's a special lens. You have to put a drop of oil on your slide and then the lens touches the oil, allows you to get even greater magnification, um, like of 100 or even more. When you look through the microscope, what you see, the image is always flipped left to right, okay, and upside down. Some images through the compound light microscope. What you see is called the field of view. Often there's a pointer in there that you can rotate around to show somebody something as they look through the microscope. Uh, then we have dissecting microscopes. Dissecting microscopes, like this one, uh, are a little bit different. They use reflected light rather than um, transmitted light. They generally have two eyepieces, two oculars, sometimes called. And they can allow you to view opaque objects, thicker objects, larger objects, because you're using light reflecting off of the sample rather than having light go through it. They give you a more three-dimensional view of your sample. They go up to about 50 times as their greatest magnification. Ours, uh, some go to 10 times, some go to 20, some go to 30. Depends on which microscope you get. Like this one goes to 30x. You can rotate the um, note the uh, lens here, and it has two different versions: a 1x and a 3x. And these eyepieces are 10x, so that gives you 30 max. So, just give you sort of a close-up view of the dead deer. So, we'll review how to use a mic compound microscope because you're going to have to use them throughout the year. So, the steps are. Important. You always carry it with two hands. They're expensive. They're fragile. They get out of alignment easily. So we don't want to uh, bang them around very much. We can clean the lenses. Sometimes they get smudgy. People touch them. You could um, clean them with lens paper, a special paper that doesn't scratch the glass. And we always start, when we're going to begin viewing our specimen, we always start on the lowest power, the shortest objective lens. We turn the diaphragm, which controls the light, to its lowest setting. 
because low power allows a lot of light to come in. And then as we go to medium or high power, less and less light gets into the microscope, so we might have to open it up to make the image a little brighter. We focus under low power using the coarse adjustment knob. So microscopes will have, compound microscopes will have two knobs, the coarse and the fine adjustment. The coarse adjustment, it moves the uh, stage up and down usually, and it moves it quite a bit, so you can focus pretty quickly. The fine adjustment, the smaller knob, is used to make tiny little adjustments to your image. It's what we use generally under high power, when you only need to move that specimen a tiny, tiny amount. <coughs> Depending on the microscope, these microscopes have just clips that hold the slide down, so you have to move the slide with your finger. We do have some microscopes that have a mechanical stage, which have little knobs that move the slide for you. I think maybe when you guys were in seventh grade, we used those, right? Yeah, they kind of, uh, the quality on those microscopes is pretty poor, and things end up breaking pretty easily, so we went to the uh, uh, sturdier microscopes, but they don't have the mechanical stage. You just move it around with your hand. You always want to make sure the object's centered before you change your power. When you switch to medium power, you know, you have to make sure the objective is actually clipped into place. If you're halfway between two objective lenses, you're not going to see anything. So you've got to make sure it's clipped into place. And then again, you focus using the force adjustment, the fine adjustment, center your specimen, adjust the diaphragm if you need to and then you can switch to high power. When you do that, you only focus using the fine adjustment. You never use the coarse adjustment once you're on high power. It can lead to the objective lens crushing the slide. Sometimes you might not see the specimen, you might lose it. If that's the case, you just go back to medium power, find it, focus, and then go back to high power. Sometimes we have to make a, a slide of a specimen we want to see. And to do that, we often do a, use a wet mount. So basically, you put a drop of water in the slide, cover it with a little plastic or glass slip, and the water adheres and keeps the slide together, allows the specimen to stay alive. It's a living microorganism. It can move around underneath the cover slip and that little piece of water that's on there. We sometimes stain our samples, which makes certain parts more visible. There's lots of stains we might use, iodine, methylene blue. Those things are taken up by the nucleus of cells, so it allows the nucleus to stand out better. Um, there's other many types of stains that are used in different contexts. Um, depends on what type of cell you're trying to see, what part you're trying to see, if you need it to stay alive or not. So just uh, some more summary, magnification, eyepiece times objective power. And the more we magnify, the smaller the area that we can see. The higher the magnification, the lower what we call the field of view. These are what our microscopes will use. They have stage clips. This is the mechanical stage that you've seen before. It's a little different. It allows you to move things a lot easier. Just got a lot of parts that often break our purposes. Uh, these are the kind of focusing knobs. We'll have a separate coarse and fine adjustment. Other types of microscopes are both built into one knob. You turn the outside for the coarse adjustment and the smaller knob for the fine adjustment. And then just a review of the parts of the microscope. Hopefully you remember lots of those. We often are going to use different units to measure things under the microscope. Um, micrometers are used most frequently. There's a thousand micrometers in a millimeter. Um, you know, when we get down to smaller uh, and smaller objects, we might use nanometers. We won't really use that. There's also electron microscopes, which uh, give a really high level of magnification and resolution. Uh, they use a beam of electrons rather than a beam of light. That's their source of illumination. 
Uh, they were developed in the 1930s. Uh, the specimen has to be placed in a special vacuum chamber in order to view it. Uh, often the specimen has to be coated in metal. So you can't generally look at live specimens, but it can give you magnification up to 10 million times. So pretty impressive magnification. Very high resolution images because the beam of electrons is a very, very small wavelength. This is like one of the first electron microscopes, this huge piece of equipment in the 1930s. Uh, today, they look sort of like a small computer. This is, still a trans this is a, a big one. This is a transmission electron microscope. They actually have one um, at Whitefront High School. They have not a transmission electron microscope, a smaller one. It fits on you know, a, a, about the size of your desk. Got a couple different pieces, a monitor. Uh, this is like an image I took from the electron microscope at uh, Whitesboro. This is um, a feather, an owl feather. These are the little parts that make up the feather. But um, you can see little hooks that hold the feather together to give it its, its shape. So it's kind of neat to use, and um, pretty neat that they have one there. They got a grant to buy it. They're expensive, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to get them. There's different types, transmission electron microscopes, in which they give the greatest magnification. And this is when the, it's like a light microscope, the beam of electron has to actually pass through the um, sample. So it has to be a thin slice. Scanning electron microscopes scan electrons over the surface of the object, so they give sort of a 3D appearance. This is a transmission electron microscope image of a mitochondria. This is a scanning electron microscope image of an ant. So the, when you see those like really close up pictures of insects and other weird things, those are often going to be scanning electron microscopes. There's lots of other types of microscopes. You don't really need to remember too much about these, but just to show you some of them, because they're interesting. Uh, scanning interferometric aperture. This microscope is interesting. It uses light to produce uh, images that have much better resolution than a usual light microscope. There's laser scanning microscopes, which use a laser to make the image. And you could view the specimen at a variety of depths and then recreate it on a computer screen. There's another type of light microscopy that uses differences between uh, parts of your sample to make different parts of the state. This is using the laser microscope. That's an image of a cell. This is using phase contrast microscopy to look at different uh, parts of, of the cell. Some other tools that are used. Microdissection equipment is used to do very, very fine procedures on tissues to make tiny uh, slices through something, to suck out the contents of a cell, to inject something into a cell. They have micro manipulators, micro pipettes, micro knives that they can use. They look at the sample under a microscope and then they can use these tiny, tiny tools. A centrifuge, this is a centrifuge up here, this uh, piece of equipment. And what you see when you turn it on, this central part spins very, very fast. There's a place where you put test tubes in. And basically it separates the parts of a liquid by density. So if you put a sample of blood in here, and a test tube that goes in this, centrifuge it for a, a little while. What will happen is the plasma will separate out from the red blood cells and separate out from the white blood cells because all those parts have different density. The densest parts go to the bottom of the test tube and the least dense stays with the top. And then you can look at those layers, you can separate them. And there's an ultra centrifuge which separates these to an even greater degree. Tissue culture is a way of growing 
samples of living cells uh, in a lab, on a petri dish oftentimes. Oh, here's the, this is a micro manipulator. So this, this woman's controlling the tools with her right hand. The samples under the microscope, she's viewing it. So she has this tiny, this is the cell, and she has a tiny little needle that maybe is going to inject something into this cell. That's a little centrifuge, another version. That's blood after being centrifuged. So these are white blood cells, red blood cells, and plasma are all separated out. That's right, yellow. That's plasma, the liquid part of the blood. A common task that needs to be done is to separate different parts of the map of a, of a sample. And we do that a couple of ways. One is through chrom chromatography. We'll do this later in the year. We have a lab in which we have to do some chromatography. And in chromatography, you're separating mixtures of substances according to various factors. The density, how much they adhere to paper, solubility. And basically, you put a sample on a piece of chromatography paper. You hold that chromatography paper over a solvent. And as the solvent creeps up the paper, it takes the solution with it. But the parts of that solution separate out. And you can look at those bands. I have a picture I'll show you in a second. Electrophoresis is another means that separates molecules. We'll do electrophoresis later in the year. This is an electrophoresis chamber. Okay. And this is the power source that goes with it. Basically, what you do with electrophoresis is you pour a gel, pour this gelatin-like material into this mold and allow it to form. Okay, and then you put your sample, often you might use protein, or DNA in these little wells. Put this in the electrophoresis chamber. That has a solution in it that conducts electricity. Put the cover on. Attach the electrodes to the power source. And electricity will flow through that liquid. And as it flows through that liquid, it carries the DNA with it. And that DNA can move through this gel, but big pieces of DNA move through it pretty slowly because it can't draw these holes. Small pieces move more quickly, and then you can see the result when you dye the gel. So it's used often for DNA or protein. Spectrometry, spectrometry, you can use to see what is in a sample, what the elements that make it up. And, oh, here's some examples. So this is chromatography, where you've had different inks put on this chromatography paper, soak them in the solvent, the ink rises to the top, but the parts separate out, the different colors that are in that ink. Here's another example. This is plant pigment. You take a bunch of spinach leaves, grind them up into a liquid, basically, put a drop of that liquid on chromatography paper, Okay, put it in a solvent. That um, plant pigments, they'll rise and they separate out. There's different pigments in the leaf, each of which can absorb different types of energy. And you can see those different parts by doing chromatography. This is an electrophoresis chamber. It's in use. And when you're done, you get a pattern that shows you different DNA samples and shows you how they separate it out according to size. This is mass spectrometry, spectrometry. And basically you put a sample of um, something in there, and this machine will tell you what it's made out, what elements. There's lots of ways of imaging things. Uh, you probably may have heard of a CAT scan. Stands for computerized axial tomography. Basically, it's a beam of x rays that rotates around. And like other x rays, soft tissue allows x rays to move through. Hard tissue, a 
absorb the x-rays, different rates, and you can make a picture out of that. I then ever had to have an MRI for some reason. An MRI is a type of nuclear magnetic resonance imaging. Basically, in an MRI, they have huge electromagnets. If you ever had an MRI, you go in, they ask you a thousand times that you're sure you have no metal. You're not wearing any metal. You have no metal implants in your body. Um, and that's because they have these super electromagnets, which basically cause the nuclei of elements to all align with that magnetic field. And then when the radio waves are turned off, the nuclei emit a signal that can be picked up by a sensor, and it's used to make an image. The MRI in, in nuclear mag medicine is, is, um, doesn't have any harmful radiation associated with it. You know, if you get an x-ray, they like, cover your body with like a lead blanket or something because x-rays damage cells. And so they try not to expose people. They try to expose people to as little x-ray radiation as possible. Um, nuclear uh, imaging doesn't produce that harmful rate. Sonograms you may have heard of, uh, sonography. Um, ultrasound means the same thing. Uses basically sound waves that we can't hear to build an image. It's used for soft tissue. Often it's used in pregnancies to see the fetus as it's growing and developing. It's used if you, you know, think you may have torn, uh, you know, a meniscus or something in your knee. See if you damage your spleen or something after an accident. Those are different reasons you might use the sonogram. Here's a CT machine. This is an x-ray machine that gives a, 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 a image of a person. That's a C, this is a CT scan of a person's head. See their eyeballs and their brain and so forth. This is an MRI, again, of a person's head. It uses those magnets to make an image. So, you know, a doctor or radiologist can interpret and look at different structures, see if there's any damage and so forth by looking at these images. And you can get a three-dimensional image, like the doctor can go through forward and backward and see the various parts. I have a CD. I had to get an MRI of my knee because I tore my meniscus two years ago. And you can see the, um, you can go and see different slices through your knee and see all the tissue and so forth. That's a fetal sonogram, obviously, of a, of a fetus in the womb. They can tell the age of the fetus by looking at the sonogram. Uh, often they can tell if it's a male or female. Um, they can see that organs are developing properly and so forth. All right. So that's a little bit about the tools that we use. We'll practice using some of these tools this week when we work with microscopes. And then we'll use various other tools throughout the year um, as we get to different labs.